Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. And we hope you're having a good day today. Hi, I am Dr. Janine Cookerard from the Department of Nursing here at Nassau Community College. And today our special guest is Dr. Albert Granger. He is the Director of Endodontics at the Harlem Hospital General Practice Residency Program and a former assistant professor at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine. Dr. Granger is a graduate of Howard University uh, of Dentistry and postgraduate of Endodontics Program at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine. In 2007, he completed the implant maxi course at the Medical College of Georgia. Dr. Granger was the president of Nassau County Dental Society in 2012. He is also a fellow of the American College of Dentists, the Academy of General Dentistry, and the Pierre Farquhar Dental Honor Society. He is an active member of the Dental American Dental Society, the New York and Nassau County State Dental Societies, and the National National Dental Association and the American Association of Endodontics. Well, welcome, Dr. Granger. Nice to what be here. What an impressive bio. <laughs> I'll check and see if it's really me. <laughs> so tell me, you are a graduate of Howard University. How many years ago did you graduate? Oh, oh you put me on the spot here. <laughs> I graduated Howard University College of Dentistry in 1987. Okay. So that's dating me right now. So how long have you been an endodontist? And where uh, did you train? You trained at Howard? But. Yes. No, well, I did my regular dental school training at Howard University. Mm-hmm. Then I did a general practice residency at Harlem Hospital for two years. And then I was a general dentist for a couple of years. And I mm-hmm. had a practice in, in Harlem mm-hmm. and a practice in Glen Cove with my sister. I always taught part-time. And one day the director of the program came in and said, Granger, Dr. Schoen is retiring. We need an endodontist. You're going back to school. Okay. <laughs> Just like that. Well, it was it was a little more than that, but we, we worked it out. I went That's back to great. school. I went got into Columbia and That's did my great. program there, and, and I taught part-time at Harlem and Columbia for probably uh, 15 years before uh, I started had to worry about college tuitions. Okay. So I stepped away for a while, and I just came back to Harlem Hospital. I'm teaching the residency program there now. So tell the listening audience, when you talk about endodontists, Correct. describe the specialty, and what does that mean? Okay. So, you know, if you've had a root canal, they, they can tell you what endodontics is. Yeah. Typically, a person who has a horrific toothache or an infection in their mouth have two options. If they want to keep the tooth, mm-hmm. they do root canal, or the option to root canal is removing the tooth altogether. So what happens with root canal is the nerve of the tooth, which is the nerve center inside the tooth, uh, has your nerve artery, nerves, arteries, and veins to keep the tooth alive. And when that is infiltrated by bacteria either through a cavity or through a crack in the tooth or from trauma, dislodging the tooth, the nerve becomes infected and starts to die. And at that point, sometimes you have pain, sometimes you don't. At that point, you have to decide whether you're gonna keep the tooth. If you wanna keep the tooth, we do root canal or you remove the tooth. So I know that regular dentists also do root canal. Yes, very well. So what makes your specialty, if someone were to choose to go to an endodontist versus a regular dentist, Correct. why would they choose you over a regular dentist? Yeah, so, you know, many general dentists do a very good job doing root canal, but not all root canals are created equal. Some of them are very, very difficult. In those cases, they send them to us. Now, what's the difference? So for endodontic school, we do another two years training, plus continuous continuing ed, keeping up with the field. But we also do anywhere from eight to 10 cases a day for every many days you work as opposed to general dentist might be one or two a week. So just on the level of the amount of procedures you do, you really can't replace experience. And you can't replace if you specialize in a particular area. Correct. There is always, I guess, it hurts less when you, you're talking about. <laughs> is it that? Is it, is it the, anest- the way you anesthetize the area? What is it that okay, comparatively? So, <laughs> so comparatively, <laughs> a nerve system a root can be one root or it can be four or five roots in a tooth, okay? Some canals are very large, some are very small. 
Some are very curved, mm-hmm. some are very straight. Some are very far back in the mouth, harder to reach. Sometimes people don't open their mouth wide, and it's hard to get back there. So in our practice, we have things like microscopes, uh, 3D scans to really get a full image of the tooth. So the difficulty sometimes is just finding canals. Mm-hmm. And once you find a canal, you have to get to the end of the canal. And sometimes the canals are very small. Mm-hmm. So it's very technique sensitive. So that's what the time and training and repetition really helps you so is there ever a time when you will say okay you don't need a root canal although this is very inflamed or the area is very inflamed you don't need is the alternatives to root canals okay so there are lots of different symptoms involved in making a diagnosis so once you have the diagnosis of needing root canal right at that point it means the tooth or the nerve is infected all right and at that point you're either locked into doing the root canal and removing the infected tissue from the tooth or removing the tooth. Now, there's certain circumstances where you may have inflammation around a tooth, but from a different cause altogether. And that's what you have. You need a good diagnostician for to make sure you're actually doing it for the correct reason. So when it comes down to the tooth itself being infected mm-hmm. and there is indication for a root canal, yes. how would one know? What is the symptoms of inflammation of the area that will require a root canal? They're different stages, all right? So if a tooth is non-vital, meaning dead and infected, you may have swelling, deep throbbing. If you have coffee, you may have a horrific toothache from coffee. Those kind of things. Pain on pressure when you bite down. For a tooth that is early in the process of dying, you may have severe cold pain that lingers after you take the cold off, or severe sweet pain, or pressure pain, or when you touch the gum above the tooth, it may hurt. Those are some of the symptoms you look for. So the the ultimate way you're diagnosed whether the tooth has to come out or mm-hmm. whether we need a root canal, root canal is correct. by x-ray. Uh, no, x-ray is part of the diagnosis. Okay. okay. They don't tell the whole story. You know, when you do diagnosis, it's almost like putting a puzzle together. Mm-hmm. So if you spend too much time looking at an x-ray, you can see just about anything. So that's not the proper way to go. As a matter of fact, I just had a patient come in today and the general dentist said, look, you need a root canal on X because she had a pain when she bit down and there was a big cavity on tooth x problem was tooth x wasn't the one giving her the pain so you have to test as well your discussion with the patient is more important than the x-ray okay mm. but you have to have the x-ray the x-ray is one piece your discussion with the patient is two pieces your objective symptoms she tells me it hurts when it's cold all right she tells me it hurts when she mm-hmm. bites and then your uh, excuse me the objective okay and subjective is it hurts when it's hot cold mm-hmm. objective is when i actually test it so i tap on one tooth it doesn't hurt mm-hmm. tap on next tooth have bad mm-hmm. pain so in the case i told you earlier the big cavity on a tooth that did need a root canal that wasn't the one that was giving the mm-hmm. pain so once we had the discussion with her and found out subjectively what her issue was, then mm-hmm. objectively I went and tested it mm-hmm. and I said, okay, boom. The other tooth right next to it was the one that needed the root canal mm. to relieve the pain, but the tooth behind it did in fact need a root canal, but it wasn't the one causing her the pain. Wow. Right? Yeah. So it's very important to talk to your patient, find out what they're feeling, and then tests to find out where those symptoms are coming from. Because and your mouth can yeah. fool you as well. You can uh, swear the pain is coming from the top, it's right. going from the bottom. I'm actually looking at that, and so it's the subjective, the objective, and the diagnostic test that kind of substantiates as to whether this is an indication for root canal or Throw not. Throw the x-ray in there as well. It's okay. A number of pieces A number of pieces to the puzzle. And if a piece doesn't fit, in that case... The general dentist wanted the other tooth, right? Right. But the puzzle didn't fit. Said she had pain on cold and biting, but that tooth didn't have pain on cold and biting. Right. So that wasn't the one. It did need root canal. Right. But that wasn't the one causing the pain. But that wasn't the one causing the pain. You want to treat the chief complaint. Yes. I woke up this morning with a bad pain every time I bit down. So if you look at an x-ray alone, you would treat the wrong tooth. So you have to talk with your patient, find out what the symptoms are, test for those symptoms, and make your diagnosis. One, two, three, four. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm Dr. Janine Cookerard, and today our special guest is Dr. Granger, and he's talking about root canal right now, endodontist. So if I were to not actually have surgery, because a lot of people are afraid of surgery, root canal, root canal. or root canal, yes. is root canal surgery? No. How would you classify it? It's a procedure. A surgery. procedure. It's a procedure. Okay. Now, I may be wrong, but I consider surgery when I take out my scalpel when I'm done, I put sutures in. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But you don't need sutures with a root canal. No, you don't. No, it's all within the confines of the tooth. Okay. See, every tooth itself has a nerve system in there that that makes the tooth alive. And again, when that nerve system is infiltrated by bacteria, you have to remove the bacteria. So when I do a root canal, am I actually whittling away at the enamel of the tooth to get to the root supply? 
How does it work? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you had root canal yourself yet? No. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's personal here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So look, when you need root canal, yeah. uh, most of the time you have a big hole in the tooth or you have a very, very large filling in the tooth or you right. may have a crown in the tooth. All right? right. So the tooth is already somewhat compromised. So the first thing we do is remove the old restoration, remove the cavity or the crack and enter the center of the tooth where the nerve is, where okay. the pulp tissue is. is right. probably a better word. And the pulp tissue consists of nerves, arteries, and veins, right. blood supply. And once you enter from the top of the tooth to where the pulp chamber is, then you go inside the canals and remove the tooth structure. Just the process of doing the root canal takes the tooth structure on the top of the tooth away. That plus the tooth structure that's already missing because of the cavity right. makes the tooth inherently weaker. Okay. So when it's done, you must go back to the general dentist and get the tooth restored and have a crown placed on the tooth to protect it from cracking. This is one thing I hate more than anything is, you know, your mouth is a sewer. It's really, it's full of bacteria. And if we do a beautiful root canal on your tooth and put a temporary filling on there and send you back to your dentist, and eight right. months later, you come back and the temporary filling's out and the filling, root canal filling material is exposed. Well, now it's completely contaminated and you have to redo it because your mouth, which is full of bacteria, contaminates the area. Or you don't go back to see the, the general dentist to get a crown to protect the tooth and you bite on a nice bagel and pff, the tooth splits and then you have to lose the tooth because the tooth is split. Okay. So the important part of root canal, not only do you have to have a good root canal, but it has to be restored properly. After the root because once done. that that nerve is extracted or taken out, right. that the remaining tooth is inherently tooth weaker. Is inherently weaker. Correct. So oh, you need to, to build it up to protect it from the bacteria in your mouth and put a crown on it to protect it from fracturing. This is a good time to take a break. This is Dr. Janine Cookerod talking with our Dr. Granger about root canals. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, ninety point three WHPC. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDCP. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking, now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Some knowledge belongs to us and us alone. The way our girlfriends walk, the way they talk, the way they touch their hair. We hold details that only a sister can know about her girls. But what about our other girls? The ones that we carry with us every day. Can we describe them when everything's right? Can we feel when something's wrong? Our bond with our sister girls gives life. But knowing your breasts can save it. You don't know what Go to knowyourgirls.org for the facts you need on breast health. That's knowyourgirls.org. Brought to you by Susan G. Coleman and the Ad Council. over 111 and I had a stroke. When I woke up, I couldn't speak or walk. 145 over 92 and then I had a heart attack. 182 over 100 and I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Everything changed. It felt like my life was over. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a heart attack or stroke are far from invisible or silent. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. 180 over 110, and I had a stroke. And I'm 33, so I never see this coming. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it. Or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. I had to tell. Brought to you by the American Heart Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. 
One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your football buddy, your football buddy, or you, your best man, your worst man, you, your dog walker, your cat jogger. While one in three adults has pre-diabetes, with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. That's doihaveprediabetes.org. Wait, did they just say one in three adults has pre-diabetes? That's 33.33333% of adults. That means it could be me, my boss, or my boss's boss, or me, my favorite sister, or my other sister. That's seven members of my 21-person romantic book club. <gasps> Wait, the one in three could be me, my karaoke partner Carol, or ugh, my karaoke enemy Jeff. I'm going to take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its pre-diabetes awareness partners. Hi, I'm Janelle Hale, founder and CEO of the National Breast Cancer Foundation. Early detection saved my life. It could save yours, too. I was only 34 years old and the mother of three when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was forced to make a decision about my health with few options. After my treatment, I made a commitment to provide help and inspire hope to those affected by breast cancer through early detection, education, and support services. I was fortunate to have resources and support through my journey, but so many facing breast cancer have to overcome the burdens of cost and fear alone. No one should face breast cancer alone. Today, NBCF has provided over 1 million early detection and patient navigation services so that women in need have access to these potentially life-saving resources. To learn what every woman needs to know about breast cancer, visit NBCF.org. 90.3 WHPC We now return to your family's health on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC And welcome back to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Janine Cookerard, and today our special guest is Dr. Granger, who is an endodontist. So welcome back, Dr. Granger. Nice to be here. So we left off with kind of talking about root canal. Say I have the inflammation, and I know that something's wrong with the tooth, Mm -hmm. and I just decide that I'm going to ignore it. A lot of people probably in your um, listening audience will probably say, okay, I'll just rinse my mouth with some salt water or I'll try to numb the area. (laughs) What can happen if I leave the infected tooth alone? Let's go back a little bit. So you you do have inflammation in a tooth that's alive that's Mm -hmm. not fully infected and that gives you that bad cold pain, sweet pain, things Mm -hmm. like that. Then as that progresses, this direction is going. Now, the best time to treat a tooth is in that stage where you're still having cold pain because it's alive. The infection is just starting, but it hasn't broken down the tooth yet, okay? It hasn't really infiltrated the entire canal system yet. In those cases, we can do now cleanly, efficiently, get you in and out usually in one visit, no real problem. Now, if you wait because the tooth, you have bad cold pain, eventually that pain will stop. When the tooth is dead and completely infected, you'll have no more cold pain. And as long as you're healthy, your body controls that pain. But one day, your resistance to that particular bacteria will be diminished and the infection starts. At that point, you can have a severe toothache. Sometimes I get people, look, when the Jets were in town, yeah. we used to take care of a lot of those guys. And you have a guy come into the office, 300 pounds, they're 6, 8, it, the humongous, and they're bawling in the crying. chair. Crying. Crying from pain from a tooth. It's unbelievable because pressure builds up in that bone and every heartbeat, oh pounding, pounding, pounding. Yeah. And I'm sure some of your listeners have been through that. Oh, yeah. It's also more difficult to get that patient numb because mm-hmm. the infection fights the antibiotic. Mm. Now, what's important about having to deal with the tooth when you get to that point is because if you don't, that infection, if it's on the top, can travel to your brain. I don't mm. want to scare you. It's not a common thing, but it right. can travel to your brain. On the bottom, it can go up under your throat and give you what's called a Ludwig's angina, which will actually suffocate you. Very ugly circumstances. Just serious. Correct. And sometimes you come into our office, if it's too late, we just can't get control of the infection and you have to lose the tooth. Can you have, a, like, a septicemia and go oh, through absolutely. the bloodstream? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You can infect your heart valves. Mm-hmm. You can infect if you have near hip joints. It may right. be able to infect those. Sure. It's ugly when you have bacteria uh, circulating throughout your mm-hmm. system. You know, they're varying degrees. You know, they're a large, there's a large normal. I call it like a pyramid. So most people on the bottom 
Right. We get in there, we take care of it. Whether the tooth is alive or dead, it's easy. It's not really actively infected. But you get to the top of that pyramid where you have actual severe pain and swelling. That's very few cases, but when they come, they're acute and they have to be handled immediately. So is it better to remove the root or the entire tooth? Is Well, if you want to maintain your tooth, you're better off doing the root canal. Now, if it's the structure of the tooth is solid, It'd be sad to remove a tooth that's a structurally sound tooth, just for expediency. So you're better off doing a root canal. If it's a compromised tooth, weak bone support, cracks or fractures, you may be better off removing it. If the infection's so bad we can't get control of it, you're better off removing it. So aesthetically, is it better to have a root canal with a crown or an implant? Aesthetically or functionally. You know, look, Tell good, me about good, both. Uh, okay, a good dentist can make anything aesthetic and beautiful. Implants are a wonderful option, but you got to remember the same thing that broke down your tooth can break down an implant. So if you have bad periodontal disease or gum disease, that same thing can traumatize the bone supporting implant. If you grind your teeth, that can fracture the original tooth, but can also weaken an implant. So you haven't, you're dealing with some of the same issues. Look, an implant is a wonderful option, point of last resort, but obviously I'm an so I'm going to say you should try to keep the tooth if you can, but I place implants as well. So look, I'm, I'm there if you need me. <laughs> So what is an implant? If you had to describe an implant, what is the material of an implant made? made? Uh, Typically titanium. There's some ceramic ones coming out now, but titanium is... is, That's uh, the actual tooth? No. That's the... That's the... What goes into the bone. What goes in the bone. Correct. Now think of it like this. A tree, right, has roots. So a tree is what you see above the ground, and below you have a root ball that holds it. So for teeth, you have the teeth, but something has to support the teeth. So the bone has to support the teeth. So you have a root that goes into the bone that supports the tooth. And that's a titanium piece. Well, if you lose that tooth, you'll lose the tooth and the roots. You'll need another root system to build your tooth on top of. So the implant will be that root system. So the actual tooth is made of what? Uh, Porcelain. Porcelain. And the different types of porcelain. And there's different types of porcelain. Some harder than others. Now, does this depend upon age as to whether you choose to do a root canal or an implant? Because I noticed that a lot of seniors, they have an implant. They have, you know, it's indicated for implant would be more suggested. Is that um, true or does it depend? No, because yeah. I've, I've done root canals on 8-year-olds and 100-year-olds. <laughs> okay. But we've also done implants on people in their 90s. I haven't done one somebody in 100, but I've done a root canal, a couple, excuse me, a couple implants in people in their 90s. So as long as they're healthy and they have enough bone, the indication is if you're missing a tooth, you can get the implant, no problem. There are lots of options for replacing, right? But if you don't want to take something in out of your mouth, or if you don't have another tooth to support a bridge on, an implant is... An uh, implant is indicated. Yes. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. And today our special guest is Dr. Granger, an endodontist. So tell me, what is the cost difference? Is it a big cost difference opting for a root canal with a crown versus a dental implant? Yes. <laughs> okay. So yes. Uh, the implants is, is, is going to cost more. More. Significantly more. Double? Yeah. Uh, easily. Because, you know, even the implant itself, the material to buy it is very expensive. And then lab work, when your dentist builds the crown, that's more expensive than typical lab work for a regular crown. So every step of the way, it's more expensive than the implant. But if you don't have an option, it's a wonderful option. Dr. Granger, when it comes down to those who are more predisposed to having these kinds of issues that would necessitate a root canal or an implant, Mm -hmm. who's at risk? Well, everybody. Everybody's at risk. Everybody's at risk, yes. Everybody's at risk for yeah. you. And, and dentistry is one of those things where, just like you maintain your car, you get the oil changed every you know 5,000 miles or whatever it is to keep that engine running, you just need to see your dentist every six months. Every six months. You know, whether you like it or not, because teeth aren't going to, they don't heal. You know, if you cut your arm, it heals. Teeth don't heal like that, right? Mm-hmm. So if you get a cavity, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, you'll need a root canal or you'll lose the tooth. And then if you don't replace that tooth, the other teeth start to move in that area. It, it's just dominoes. One thing falls and the other thing falls. So the best case is to see your dentist every six months, mm-hmm. get a good cleaning, mm-hmm. a good checkup, and maintain your dental health. And even then, sometimes you have a problem. <laughs> Are certain people more prone to cavities, the way that the actual tooth is structured? You know, some people, they have more, maybe their tooth is a little more creviced in terms of the top of the tooth? Yeah. Are they prone, or is it just is it the saliva? What makes a person prone to cavities? Well, now, 
You're a nurse? Yes. Okay, so you've seen a lot of people with different medications they take and their right. salivary flow yes. decreases. Right. Well, the saliva is a natural flushing action for it your is. mouth, and it keeps your mouth, let's we'll say, sticky, less cavities. So that's why as you get older, sometimes we see senior citizens get something called root caries because their mouth dries out, not only from age, but from also medications they're taking, and they're more prone to caries at that point. And look, we can go into different groups. You know, some people right. just... Diabetes, I, I always, right. Diabetes. You're right. I hate to hear that the term, I have soft teeth. But, you know, like I tell you, some people, some people just have soft teeth. <laughs> and they're yeah. more prone to cavities. Right. And their mother was like that. Right. You know, the greatest predictor of health is looking at your family. And yes. you, can, you can predict it. I think the same thing pretty much holds for your teeth. Now, it might be crucified for saying that. But like I tell you, if your mother lost all her teeth from constant cavities, you better stay on top of your teeth. Just like if your father died of a heart attack and your uncle died of a heart attack at 50, at 49, you better go to the So that's one of the reasons why I know when I go to the dentist, they ask me questions like, what are some of the diseases or health conditions that has run on your mother's side, your father's side, because they're trying to see where I fit in in terms of the health history. Yes. So it's very, very important that although you understand that sometimes you are more predisposed to certain things based upon your history. Absolutely. Your health history. Your Absolutely. teeth is just a byproduct of your health. Uh, yes. So very it, important part of it. So, so now when it comes down to brushing, what kind of toothbrush do I use to brush to maintain dental hygiene? And do I use the harder? Because I like to get a good scrub when I brush my teeth. Well, you, you know, know I'm, I'm an endodontist. So I don't want you to brush your teeth or go to the dentist. <laughs> 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 you just come straight to just you. Just come straight to me. <laughs> no, uh, look, a soft toothbrush is what's recommended. Yes. Whenever you see your dentist and you have you see the hygienist and you have your teeth clean, they'll sit there and they'll go through the exact technique on proper brushing to yeah. eliminate, make sure you... The biggest problem is people put a toothbrush in their mouth, shake it around for a few minutes, rinse out, and they're done. The proper way to brush your teeth is going to take you over two minutes to do it. Take your time. you got to get all the surfaces. You have to use the proper motion. And your hygienist or dental dentist will show you how to do that. So how can the listen audience get in touch with you? You're the interdontist. You have a lot of years of experience. How do we contact you? Well, I mean, I have a I have a website. I'm Tell me the, the name of your website. Premier Long Island. Premier P R E M M I E R Long Island spelled out. dot com. You know, we have three offices on Long Island: Garden City, Hicksville, and Patchogue. I have a partner and five associates, so we're there six days a week to take care of you if any if you have any problems. That's yes, wonderful to know. So I'll be knocking on the office Come on down. door. You're the next contestant. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Dr. Granger, for talking to us about endodontistry on our show today. This is Dr. Janine Kukura. Thank you for listening to this edition of Your Family's Health.